Clearly, this scripture is talking about physical senses. 1 Corinthians 12, 17 speaks of comparisons between the physical and spiritual bodies. If the whole body were an eye, how would it hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? Clearly, this scripture talks about the, the body and, and how important the parts of the body are, but this scripture clearly shows us and talks about physical senses, doesn't it? In Matthew 13, 13, Jesus uses physical senses to describe spiritual lack. This is why I use these parables. This is Matthew 13, 13, Jesus speaking. This is why I use these parables. Listen to this now. He said, this is why I use these parables. For they look, but cannot see. They hear, but don't really listen or understand. Here, Jesus is using physical senses to describe spiritual lack. Now, it's important to get this. It's important to understand this. All throughout the Bible, and I can give you many, many more scriptures, but I would rather you go and look those up yourself. Search those. You know, let me just take a side note here and break here for a second and say this. Many times when you come on Sunday morning and you hear a message, you're going to hear a very short version. We can't give you, I can't give you when anybody else who speaks, you know, Bill spoke last week, we can't give you the full everything we want to give you in those short 30 minutes that we have. It's important for you as believers to go home and dig into the Word of God. What these Sunday ser sermons should be is just something that, that you know, uh, whets your appetite, that gets you excited. It's an appetizer for the meal. So you should be going home and digging in throughout the week into this message. But I can tell you there are many, many more scriptures, hundreds, that talk about physical senses. And there are many that talk about physical senses and spiritual senses, and they parallel each other. This is a clear connection here, this scripture, between the physical and spiritual senses. And it's because of this connection, because of our senses, that we have a difficult time understanding the love of Jesus. Now, let me just stop here and, and ask you this. How many of you, how many of you, what, since you, how many of you are a born-again believer? Raise your hand. You're a believer. Okay, good. Almost the entire congregation. So, how many of you, since you became a believer, have a difficult time loving like Jesus loves you? Okay, almost everybody. Obviously. The reason we have a difficult time is because we are so connected to the physical. We're going to see this in a few moments here. If we allow our physical senses to dictate how we love, who we love, when we love, where we love, and how much we love, we will never truly love like Jesus loves. Never. 1 John 4, 7, and 8 says this, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Every time you see this word love in this scripture, it is referring to agape love. This word love was translated from the Greek word agape. In the English language, we have one word for love. Right? I love God. I love my wife. I love my children. I love my friends. I love pizza. Right? So we have one word for love. And if we say, I love pizza, and in the next breath we say, I love my wife, or I love my husband, or I love my children, what defines the difference between that word? Between those sentences, right? I love pizza, I love you. <laughs> There's always one in the crowd. Always one in the crowd. <laughs> or two in the crowd. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I mean, it, it, it actually diminishes the, the, the meaning of love if we're using love for everything. Right? I love football, except 
last night when Michigan got trounced. I, I love my wife. I love God. I mean, we, we have one word for love. But in the Greek, they have four words for love. And agape is one of them. In fact, agape is the highest level. The definition of agape is selfless, sacrificial, unconditional love. The highest of the four types of love in the Bible. The Bible also speaks of three others. Eros, and eros is the physical, sensual love between a husband and wife. Philia, which is a, a friendship. Friendship type of love. And, and we know that because Philadelphia in the United States was taken from the, the root word philia. And it was also taken from the city of Philadelphia in the Bible. Uh, the storge is the last form of love and it is family love. It's the bond among family members. Among father, mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers. 1 Thessalonians 4.9 tells us this. It says, we, but we don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other, for God himself has taught you to love one another. Now, this scripture is, is important for us to look at because in this scripture, it, tell, it talks about two different types of love. We don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other. That is philia, that love. If you look at the Greek word, that is philia. But then it goes on to say, for God himself has taught you to love one another. That is agape. So when you break that scripture down and you look at it, the first part of it is we don't need to write to you about the importance of philia. For God himself has taught you agape. Now this is important to see because even though there are different types, there's friendship love and there's, there's the storge, which is the family love, and there's the eros, which is the romantic love between a husband and a wife, and, and then agape. Agape is the greatest of them all. See, because without agape, see, God is love, the scriptures tell us, right? So if God is love, then outside of God, there is no love. Do you understand that? Without God, there is no love because God is love. God defines love. God is love. So without agape, without God, without godly love, then there is no eros, there is no philia, and there is no storge. There's no other love besides God. Satan does not have love. Satan is full of hate. The opposite. Satan is completely the opposite of God. So he is complete opposite. So if God is love, Satan is hate. Now we know as believers, and we know by the word of God, and I spoke about this a few weeks ago, that you cannot serve yourself. Either you're serving God or you're serving Satan. Right? It's the way it goes. The Bible tells us you cannot serve two masters. Jesus said you will either love one and hate the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both masters. You can only serve one. And you're going to serve a master, and it's either going to be God or Satan. You can't say, well, I serve myself, Pastor Bill. No, you don't. Because if you serve yourself, you serve Satan. That's right. So God is love. And Satan is twisted and polluted and cheapened, cheapened the definition of true love. Let me make this clear. Satan has not twisted, polluted, and cheapened true love, but the definition of true love. He cannot change true love because God is love. Actually, he can't even change the definition of true love. He can only redefine it in our minds. Did you get that? If you're not taking notes today, please go to the uh, version. And look at all the notes are on your version today. Please go there and take a look at that this week. Because I want you to get some of these things. You need to understand. I hope you're getting this today. Satan cannot redefine true love. Because God is love. But he can redefine it in your mind. He can't change the definition. He can't, he can't change it at all. But he can cause you or get you to think of it differently in your mind. And get me to think of it differently in our minds. And this is what he's done. Let me give you three examples of how he's done this. We think, listen, many of us here today, all of us that raised our hand and said, yeah, I've had a difficult time loving like Jesus loves since I became a born-again Christian. This is why. Many of us think we can choose who we love, we can choose how we love, and we can choose when we love. Right. 
Man, it's quiet here this morning. <laughs> and this is not uh, the world I'm talking about. I'm not talking about those out in the world. This is the church I'm talking about. The world is lost and doesn't know what true love is, or should I say doesn't know who true love is. The world doesn't know Jesus, because, so they don't know truth. And so because they don't know truth, they don't know true love. The world is living by the twisted, distorted <coughs> definition of love that Satan has given. Okay? In fact, even if you take those four Greek words about love, one of them is eros. And eros is a romantic love, but it's a romantic love between husband and wife as defined by the Bible. It's a romantic love in marriage, only in the confines of marriage, and in the marriage that's defined in the Bible, one man and one woman. Amen. That's the only way it's, it's eros. That's the only way it's romantic love. If it's outside of marriage, it's not love at all, because God is love, and God defines what love is, and if, and if it's in marriage, it's love, it's eros, and if it's outside of marriage, it's lust. But I'm telling you right now, the world wants to co convince us, and many in the church have, have even been sucked into this to think they can love, and they can have that romantic kind of love outside of marriage, and you just can't. Amen. It does not happen. It's lust, it's a lie from the enemy, and it will destroy you. Amen. Love is from God and only from God. And so if you're going to truly love, if you're going to call it love, then it has to fit in his definition of what love is, doesn't it? Yes. And that goes for us as believers. If we love one another, if we say we love one another, then it has to fit in this definition of what love is. And if it doesn't fit in this definition, then it's not love. Right. Let's look again. See, we need to understand this. If, if Satan can, can redefine this in our minds, if we can get sucked into that and even get the church to think that and to believe that way, because that's who he's after. He's after the church. He's not after the world. He's already got them, right? They're already lost. So he's, he's already, they're already sucked into the, his redefinition of love. But he wants to get the church not to love because that's how he can stop the church. If he can get us to keep biting and devouring one another... And to live by his definition of love, then he has stopped us cold in our tracks. Let's go back to our, one of our opening scriptures, John 13, 34 and 35. Jesus said, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Now get verse 35. Your love for one another. Now remember, this love in verse 35 here, that is agape. All throughout the scripture, it's agape. So your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So what Jesus is saying, how are you going to prove you're my disciples? By your love. By your love. He's talking to believers. He's talking to, to disciples. Listen, do you understand the gravity of this scripture? The importance of this scripture you need to understand the situation when Jesus spoke the scripture. Jesus was eating the last supper with the disciples. He's eating the last supper with the disciples. He's sitting around with them eating this last supper just before he goes to the cross. And, and just before this, he spoke this scripture, uh, he gave the bread to Judas and, and dipped it in the bowl and gave it to Judas and then told Judas to go out and do what he had to do. So Judas left the room. So inside the room at that time, the men that were left in that room, the 11 men that were left there at that time were the 11 men who would go and give their lives later for the kingdom of God. Amen. All 11 of them would die a martyr's death. Every one of them would give their life for the kingdom of God. And so he's talking to these men. And, and what's going to give them the power? What's going to give them the courage? What's going to give them the strength to make it through, to give their lives for the kingdom of God later in their lives? Love. And Jesus knew it. So he spoke to them and he said, this is how the world will know that you are my disciples. Love one another. He's speaking to believers. 
here's the difficult thing about this today. It's, a, it, it's important for us to understand this. That if the enemy can infiltrate the church and redefine love, he will not only stop the church, but he can cause us to go where he's supposed to go. We're going to talk about this in the next com in the coming three weeks. We're going to see this very closely, revealed very much in front of our eyes. But I'm telling you right now, folks, it's all about love. And if we don't love, then what do we have? We'll get into the scripture in, in Corinthians, but it says that if we don't have love, then we're just a bunch of noise. <clears throat> and that's agape love talking about in that scripture. If we don't have love, we're a bunch of noise. You can say you love somebody all day long. You can say you love your brother and sister all day long, but if you don't act it out, if you don't live it out, if it's not coming from your heart, then it's nothing but a bunch of noise. And, and the reason this is so important for the church to get this and for us to get this is because everything we do has to be centered around and driven by love. And if it's not, then we're just doing busy work. Do you understand? Yes. We can have all the programs and we can have all these events and we can get out there and do all this outreach, but if it's not centered around love and driven by love and flowing out of our hearts with love, then it's absolutely worthless. Amen. And here's another thing. Why would we want to win souls to the kingdom of God and get them to come to the river if the river is not flowing with love? Amen. Then we just become just like the Pharisees. Tie up heavy loads and put them on men's backs, but don't lift a finger to help them. We come, become just like the Pharisees, following a bunch of rules and regulations, but we truly don't love. I believe that the world is confused by the church today. I believe that the world looks at the church as a whole and is confused. Because, see, the world even knows what this love is supposed to look like. But the problem is, is they see it so rarely. We turn more people off than we turn on to Christ. Because of the lack of love. And love is not about something you say or I say. It's about something we are. It's who we are. If we love, it will show on the inside. It will motivate and direct everything we do. We'll revolve around love. We get so wrapped up in our daily lives and in, in, in all the things that we're doing on a daily basis that we, we go through motions and we allow the enemy to redefine love in our minds and we, we, we talk about it all the time. Oh, you need, to, you need to come to church and you need to serve Jesus. It's the greatest thing in the world. But if we don't have love flowing from the inside out, it's useless. 1 John 2, 4 through 11 says this, If someone claims I know God but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not, giving, uh, not living in the truth. That's a pretty strong scripture, isn't it? Yes. If someone claims I know God but doesn't obey His commandments, that person is a liar. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love Him. This is how we know we are living in Him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it is an old one that you have had from the very beginning. This old commandment to love one another is the same message you've heard before. Yet it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment. And you are also living it. For the darkness is disappearing and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims I am living in the light but hates his fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. Now, do you, do you see the end of this scripture? This is important. 
What does it say the last four words? Having been what? Blinded by the darkness. Here we go talking about senses again. See, this is such a strong and powerful scripture. Because this scripture is telling us that if we truly, if we truly love God, then we'll live as Jesus did. And I kind of set you up at the beginning of this. Yes, I did. I'm sorry. I kind of set you up and asked you how many were believers and asked you how many had a hard time living or loving as Jesus did. Well, if you can't love as Jesus did, then you're not living as Jesus did. I'm sorry for setting you up, but I set myself up too because I have a hard time doing it too. But again, we have to understand this because we're so connected to our senses, we have to separate the two. Listen, folks, you, you cannot... You and I cannot live the way we used to before we gave our heart to the Lord. Amen. We can't. We need to, somehow, this needs to get through to us. We need to understand that if we're going to live for Jesus, if we're giving Him our heart, we're sacrificing and surrendering everything. That's what that means. We're giving it all. We're laying it all on the line. We're saying, I, I, I completely... Give up my old life. And I give everything to you, Jesus. You have complete control. That's what salvation is. If you still want to be in control, then you don't want to be saved. <laughs> it's kind of like this. It's like you're, you're lost at sea. Anybody see the uh, movie Castaway? Tom Hanks. Okay. You remember when he was finally got off the island and he's on that rickety raft out in the open ocean and the Storms are coming, and the raft is blown apart, and there's barely any. And then he lost Wilson. Saddest part of the movie right there. <laughs> Wilson! <laughs> and he's, he's laying on that raft, and he's almost dead from heat dehydration. And, he's, and, there, and there's nothing. There's no hope. He needed to be saved, didn't he? Yeah. Could he save himself? No. He had no power to do it. But, but as that ship pulled up, as that ship pulled up, and he reaches out to it. If that ship pulled up and he went, I got this. Yeah. Ship goes by, he dies, movie ends. That would have been a terrible ending, right? <laughs> terrible. But as that ship pulls up, what does he do? He reaches out. At that point, it's, it's, he's given up everything. He's given up all his will. It's up to them, right? And that's what we do with Jesus. We're, we're, we're lost. We're going to die in our sin. And he pulls up and says, I'm here to save you. And if we reach out and say, I want to be saved, then that means we give up all of our will. We say, it's, it's all about you. Well, a lot of times what happens is we want to get in the boat, but then we want to tell them where to go. You know? And here's the thing. This is the boat. And when you get in this boat, you don't tell this boat where to go, what to do, or how to do it. If you love, the scripture says, if we just read it, if you love God, this is how He knows we love Him. We obey His commandments, right? We obey this. We get in the boat and we say, you take us where you want us to go. Your kingdom come, and your will be done in earth as in heaven. Amen. See, your definition of love just won't cut it. If it could, if it did, then you would need saving, would you? So it's all about who he is and about his love. This is... Uh, this love of God is senseless love. It's hard to grasp. It's hard to understand. And the enemy wants you to rely on your own senses. Listen, he wants you to judge people by the way they look. He wants you to judge people by the way they smell. He wants you to judge people and uh, he wants you to, to hang around people that flatter you and tell you things you want to hear. He wants you to only be around people that make you feel good about yourself. He wants you to avoid people who leave a bad taste in your mouth. 
And, and look, you can do that if you want to, but if you do that, that's not agape love. That's your love. That's Satan's definition of love. Right. <clears throat> See, because Satan wants to define the definition. He wants to make the definition of love conditional. Right? If, if they look the part, you know, if they smell good, right? If they, if they always give me compliments, you know, don't confront me. Don't, don't be real with me. Don't tell me things I really need to hear from the Word of God. Just tell me things I like to hear. You know, all of those things, if they do those things, then I love them. Oh, I love them. Do you understand that if we love as Jesus did, the word hate never comes out of our mouth? I know, I know it's a very difficult thing to go from what we've always defined love as to this definition. But I'm trying to tell you this morning, the only way we can do it is living by this word. If we've truly given up our life to the one who saves us, then it becomes easy for us because we just live through his eyes. We walk in his steps. We love as he loves. And that means we can't choose who we love and when we love how we love, where we love, how much love we give. And I'm going to tell you this, folks, it's, it's just like everything else in the kingdom of God. It takes repetition. It takes consistency. It takes determination. Because I'm going to tell you this right now, and, and Kim and I have made a real point over the last many years, several years, to really cultivate this in our lives because there came a point in our lives, and I'll just open up and say this, not something in my notes, I'm just going to tell you this. There came a point in our lives we looked at each other and we said, we're not really living this. We were ministers on staff at a church going through the motions. I mean, we, we felt we had a form, we, you know, we felt we had a form of godliness. You know what I mean? We went to church, we, we, we worked at a church. And we were very involved and, and we were at a level where we felt we loved people and we felt we lived out the Word of God. But really, when we examined ourselves next to this, we didn't match up. We didn't measure up. You know what I'm talking about? And when that conviction came, like it's coming on you right now, from hearing a message like this, we would take, we would go home and go, man, I, I need to change. Lord, I need to do something different. I need to change. I need to be more like you. We would say it, but we wouldn't put it into action because of the difficulty that it took to make that change. Because you see, if right now you're feeling like, man, I, I don't love like I should. And for some of you, maybe for many of you, that's going to mean an apology to somebody. That may mean you need to go to someone and ask for forgiveness. That may mean that you, you need to change the way you do things. That may, may mean you need to change your thought process and your, the way you think about people. Because if, if you only hang around people who make you feel good, who fit into your stereotype, that's not love. Do you understand? It shouldn't matter what they look like. And let me just say this. Here's another thing also that I need to mention. This love that we're talking about, the senseless love, it's not fake either. And it's not patronizing. It's not, oh, Angelo, I, I love you. I love you. I do. You're, you know, you're a good kid. And then, you know, in your mind, you're, you're talking down to this person, you know, because they don't meet up to your standards or up to where you think they should be. 
They, they don't look like you look. Maybe the color of their skin. I'm just going to mention this. I, I, you know what? We were in the South for 10 years, and, or what? In the South for 22 years, but we were in Louisiana for 10 years. And, and I got to tell you, racism is unfortunately alive and well in the South, but it's alive and well in the North, too. When we moved back to Michigan four years ago, I was shocked at the segregation here in, in, in the North. Shocked. And I'm, tell, I'm just telling you right now, the church should look like it's going to look in heaven. Amen. When I look around and see all white churches, and all black churches, and all Hispanic churches, and all, I, I don't get it. We should worship together. Amen. Amen. But I'm going to tell you what it takes for that to happen. It takes love. True love. A God they love. Because that's the only thing that can break down those barriers. Right. And folks, if we're nothing else, we're going to be a church of love. We're going to lead with love. We're going to love our brothers and sisters. And this whole message today is about loving each other here in the church. If we can't love each other, we'll never be able to love the world. And I'm telling you, it, it, it happens far too often in churches today. We'll smile and we'll shake each other's hand and greet one another. And I'm going to tell you, I love this church and I think we're doing a fantastic job. But I still think we have room to improve. Okay? We have room to improve. We, we can love better than we love. And it shouldn't matter what somebody looks like or what they smell like or even how they sound. If somebody comes into this church and they got a foul mouth because they're, you know, a sinner. Listen, Robert Morris says this all the time. I love this statement. He says, golfers golf, swimmers swim, and sinners sin. What do you expect, right? Right. right? But even if they just gave their heart to the Lord and they got a foul mouth, don't you dare look down upon them. Amen. Right? Start criticizing them. Talking about them. Just love them. Just love them. I want to give you this scripture. Galatians 5, 13 through 15 says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. <clears throat> Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. This is the last scripture I want to give you. This is going to be a scripture that we're going to end the service with every week. So I want you to stand right now. They're going to begin to play. And, and I'm going to read this scripture to you. I just want to pray with everyone today. I feel like this is the type of message. How many of you would raise your hand and say, Pastor Bill, I, I need to be able to, I need to love more. I need to love more like Jesus loves. I need help there. Amen. I think everybody in this place needs that. And I hope over the next three weeks that you come to this series and, and you allow the Lord to work in your heart and cultivate in your heart this love. Because folks, I'm telling you right now, I, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if we can grasp hold of this and if we can truly love as Jesus loves, we will, we will rock this world for the kingdom of God. We will turn it upside down. Amen? Amen. Second Thessalonians 3 5 says this May the Lord lead your heart into a full understanding and expression of the love of God and the patient endurance that comes from Christ. And that's my prayer for our church, for the river. May the Lord lead our hearts into full understanding and expression of the love of God. Would you just raise your hands this morning? Father, change our hearts today.
to be just like you. Change our hearts today, Father. Every person in this place this morning, God, change us. Mold us and shape us into what you want us to be. Father, lead our hearts into a full understanding and expression of your love. May it resonate with us. Father, may it, may it flow through our veins. May the agape love flow through us, Father, today. Change us, Father. We need your help today, God.